Hey guys, even though October is over, I decided to extend this year's Horror Month out into November, and I'm continuing 2022's Horror Month with a review of the 1984 horror classic, A Nightmare on Elm Street, which I have both on Blu-ray and on DVD. Now, the DVD I have here came on the Nightmare on Elm Street box set. Now, some of you might be thinking, wait a minute, Christian, didn't you review this movie already? And that's right, I did. I actually reviewed this film along with all the sequels all the way back in 2011 for Season 1 of Horror Month. But I decided to mark all my old Nightmare on Elm Street reviews as unlisted. However, you can still see them on the playlist for Horror Month Season 1, which I'll leave a link to in the description below. Also, back in 2018, me and some friends of mine did an almost three-hour-long retrospective on the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, which I'll also leave a link to in the description below, and audio from that retrospective will be included in this video. Yeah. I just wanted to talk about the movie again, because A Nightmare on Elm Street is a very important movie to me. Now, A Nightmare on Elm Street is a supernatural slasher film written and directed by Wes Craven, who prior to this directed films like The Last House on the Left, The Hills Have Eyes, and Swamp Thing. And he would go on to direct movies like The Serpent and the Rainbow, The People Under the Stairs, and Scream. Now, A Nightmare on Elm Street is the film that made Wes Craven a household name, and in my opinion, this is his best film. As far as I'm concerned, A Nightmare on Elm Street is Wes Craven's masterpiece. And this is one of my top ten favorite films of all time. Not just horror films, but films in general. Now, everybody knows the premise of A Nightmare on Elm Street. What if our dreams are more real than we think, and what if there was something in our dreams that could kill us? Which I think is a brilliant concept for a horror film, because human beings need sleep. How do you prevent yourself from sleeping, and how do you prevent yourself from dreaming? Like, if you're trapped in your dreams, there really is no escape. Now, it should be noted that this wasn't the first horror film to mess around with the concept of dreams. Prior to this, you had Don Coscarelli's Phantasm, which also had a lot of moments where you weren't sure how much of it was real and how much of it was a dream. A few years prior to this, there was a movie called The Slayer, which I think was about a monster from a woman's dreams that comes to life. Now, probably the most notable example I could think of, notable because it came out the same year as this, was Joseph of Rubin's Dreamscape. Dreamscape was sort of a sci-fi take on this premise. It was about people with psychic abilities who were able to enter other people's dreams, and that movie also dealt with the concept that if you die in your dreams, you die in real life. And I remember hearing that Wes Craven was actually afraid that that movie would hurt the success of A Nightmare on Elm Street, even though he wrote the script for A Nightmare on Elm Street long before Dreamscape, he was afraid that people would think Nightmare on Elm Street was a Dreamscape ripoff. It also doesn't help matters that in Dreamscape, there's a scene where the villain sprouts knives from his fingers. And of course, the whole idea of spirits being able to either visit or haunt us in our dreams, I think goes all the way back to mythology. Boas Craven has claimed that he got the idea for this movie from reading a series of newspaper articles about young men, I think from Southeast Asia, who were absolutely terrified to go to sleep and eventually they ended up dying in their sleep. And if you hear Wes Craven talk about it in interviews, it's actually really freaking creepy. And I read a newspaper article in the LA Times about um, an emigrant, a recent emigrant to the United States, a young man who um, had complained to his parents about severe nightmares. I think they were from um, Cambodia. And uh, they, he was assured that nightmares were, you know, not that unusual. He shouldn't be so afraid. And... He started staying up um, and refusing to sleep, and the family became very um, concerned, and they sought the help of a doctor. The doctor prescribed sleeping pills. The young man apparently took them, and in the end, it turned out he did not. He was taking them and putting them aside. He had a coffee pot in his room after a while to stay awake, and nobody knew quite what to do. At one point, he was downstairs watching television in the middle of the night, and he fell asleep, and his family noticed finally that he was asleep, and they brought him up to his bed whole family went to bed themselves thinking, thank God, finally he's sleeping. 
heard screams an hour later, ran into his room, he was thrashing in his bed. By the time they got to him, he was dead. And uh, over the next nine months, I found two more articles like that. Now, when Wes Craven first wrote the script to this movie, he shopped it around to different studios and they all rejected it, questioning whether a horror movie about dreams could actually be scary. I think even Sean S. Cunningham, who of course worked with Wes Craven on The Last House on the Left and is perhaps best known as the director of the original Friday the 13th, he even questioned whether that concept could work. But eventually the script fell into the hands of Robert Shea, who was the head of New Line Cinema. Now, New Line Cinema, prior to this, was really just a small indie company, and they didn't really make movies, they just distributed films. But there's a reason New Line Cinema would later become known as the house that Freddy built, because this was their first major hit, and it was the movie that made New Line a major player in Hollywood. Now, it should be noted that Bob Shea put a lot on the line for this movie. The film was made for an incredibly low budget, and he apparently sold his own house in order to finance the film. And if this movie were to do poorly, it would have financially wrecked New Line Cinema, and it probably would have ruined Bob Shea's life. So, despite the fact that he apparently butted heads with Wes Craven a lot during the production of the film, and despite the fact that the film's relatively confusing ending was kind of his fault, he still deserves all the credit in the world, in my opinion. So, the plot of A Nightmare on Elm Street is it begins where a 15-year-old girl named Tina Gray is having these horrific nightmares of this boogeyman-like figure with a horribly burnt face and what appears here to be knives for fingernails on his right hand. The next day, she finds out that her best friend Nancy has been having the same dreams as her. That night, Tina has another nightmare about this man, and this is where we as the audience realize that this man in her dreams is real, and anything he does to her in the dream world happens to her physically in the real world. So, in the dream, this man kills her by slicing her open, and the same thing happens to her in reality and now her boyfriend Rod is accused of the crime. So then the narrative really switches over to Nancy, and Nancy continues having nightmares about this man, and starts to question her own sanity, and her boyfriend and parents start to think that she might be going crazy. Eventually, Nancy discovers that this man in her dreams is actually the ghost of a dead child murderer named Freddy Krueger, who sometime before she was born murdered several kids in the town and was arrested, but freed on a technicality, so the parents of the kids that Krueger murdered organized a mob to go after him, and they killed him, and then covered up the crime, and it turns out that Nancy's parents, and possibly her friend's parents as well, were part of this mob that killed Freddy, and now her and her friends are paying for their parents' sins. Now, the film stars Heather Leikenkamp as Nancy Thompson. Now, I've said it many times before, but Nancy is easily my favorite final girl from any slasher film. Even though I've always resisted calling the original Nightmare on Elm Street an outright slasher film, I've always liked to consider this more of a supernatural ghost film that just happens to have the trappings of the slasher genre. But technically speaking, it still fits into the slasher category, and again, Nancy is easily my favorite protagonist from any slasher film. I think one of the reasons Nancy has always appealed to me as a character is she feels believable. She feels like somebody that you and me could know, and she legitimately does seem like the girl next door. I would argue even more so than Laurie Strode from Halloween. And Heather Leikenkamp, I think she was 20 when they shot this, but I could actually buy her as a teenager. There's so many other slasher films where they cast people who clearly are in their 20s or maybe even 30s in some cases, playing teenagers, and this is one of the few slasher films I could think of where the teenage characters, well, at least Nancy, legitimately does feel like a teenager. 
And Heather Likenkamp plays Nancy with the right combination of strength and vulnerability. Now, even though in the sequels, at least in pop culture's eyes, Freddy would become the star of these movies, in this first film, it really is about Nancy. She legitimately is the protagonist of the film, and the film is really about her struggle against this evil force that has killed her friends and has effectively destroyed her life. And it's so satisfying when she's finally able to stand up and turn the tables on this monster. I also met Heather Camp at a convention back in 2016. I also got her autograph, which I have thumbtacked to my wall, which is probably not the proper way to hang up an autograph, and I'm sure some autograph collectors are cringing right now. Also, I stupidly didn't get a sleeve for it, so the marker, as you can see, is starting to wear off. And then you have Amanda Weiss as Tina Gray who is actually a pretty complex and sympathetic character. We realize that she's from kind of a broken home. Her father left her and her mother years earlier, and even though we only see him in one scene, it seems like her mother's boyfriend is kind of a dick. And even though we only see her mother in one scene, we do get the impression that her mother might be somewhat neglectful or somewhat of an absentee parent. It's also implied that Rod might be somewhat abusive, and we're actually led to believe at first that Tina might be the lead protagonist because she's the first person that we're introduced to, which makes her death all the more shocking. And you could tell Wes Craven was copying what Hitchcock did with Psycho, where we were led to believe that Janet Lee as Marion Crane was going to be the main character, until we see her get killed in the shower. And Tina's death in the movie is one of the most iconic scenes in horror movie history, where we see her get levitated off the bed and then dragged across the ceiling and cut open by some kind of invisible force that we as the audience realize is Freddy. And I gotta say, I I envy the people who saw this for the first time back in 1984, not knowing anything. They must have been like, what the fuck is going on when the scene happens? And I gotta say, the special effects in the scene still hold up today. And even after she dies, we see Tina show up frequently throughout the movie as a ghost. And the scenes with Tina's ghost are so creepy, especially when Nancy first sees it in the school hallway in the bloody body bag. Or when Nancy sees her again, and we see all those eels at her feet, and a centipede comes out of her mouth, and I don't know if this was done intentionally, but the way the opening on the body bag for her face looks, she almost looks like a twisted, perverted parody of the Virgin Mary. You also have Nick Corey as Rod Lane. Now, Nick Corey is not the actor's real name. I think his real name is... Jesus Garcia, although the Jesus is shortened, I believe. And actually, the reason he acted under a pseudonym is actually a little fucked up. Apparently, his agent told him to go for a name that sounded more Caucasian. But I thought he did a great job in this movie. Now, yes, he doesn't exactly look like a teenager. Regardless, he plays Rod with such a raw emotional vulnerability, especially when he's locked up in the jail cell. And you can tell that even though he didn't actually kill Tina, he feels like he could have saved Tina and he failed to. And you see him racked with guilt, where even though the character of Rod was a bit of a dick, you can't help but to empathize with him. And then you have Johnny Depp as Glenn, Nancy's boyfriend. This was Johnny Depp's first movie. I think this is even before he did 21 Jump Street. And Johnny Depp does do a pretty good job in this movie, especially for a first role. I will say, however, that the character of Glenn, while he is a likable character, he's probably the least interesting of the four main teenage characters in the movie. Now, most people watching this video have probably already seen the film, but in case you haven't, this is a massive spoiler coming up, but he does eventually die in the film, and Glenn's death in the movie is probably the most iconic death scene in the entire film, and probably in the entire Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, where he gets eaten by his bed, and then you see a geyser of blood shoot up out of the bed. And I remember when I first saw this movie when I was 10, that scene legitimately made me go, Oh my fucking god! 
Now, before they casted Johnny Depp, Charlie Sheen was originally going to play Glenn, but he wanted too much money. And again, this was a very low-budget film, and they simply did not have the money that Charlie Sheen was asking for in the budget. Other actors who were considered for the role of Glenn were C. Thomas Howell and even Jackie Earl Haley. And I cannot not talk about Robert Englund as Freddy Krueger, one of the most iconic horror movie villains of all time, and... And this character alone, I think, really did become the symbol of 1980s horror. And it was the role that defined the rest of Robert Englund's career. Like, when Robert Englund dies, he's going to be remembered as Freddy Krueger. The same way that Bill Lugosi's name became synonymous with Dracula. I also met Robert Englund back in 2018, and he could not have been nicer. And while you certainly gotta give Robert Englund all the credit in the world for playing this character so well, a lot of credit should also be handed to David Miller for his makeup effects. Now, while it's hard to imagine anybody else besides Robert Englund playing this role, Wes Craven apparently originally wanted a stuntman to play this character until he realized, yeah, this is not working out. I need a legitimate actor playing this character. And apparently one of the actors who auditioned and even did a makeup test for Freddy was David Warner. And it would have been really interesting to see how David Warner would have played this character. Now, even though in the sequels, Freddy Krueger would become a lot more comedic, in this first film, he's legitimately a scary character. Because he can invade your dreams and your mind. Like, how do you get away from something like this? And also, whenever you see Freddy in the movie, he's in the shadows, and he legitimately seems like something out of our worst nightmares. And there is a degree of mystique to this character, at least in the first movie. Yeah, I know I explained his origin in the plot description, but let's say you're watching this movie for the first time, having no idea what it's about, and having no idea of the character's backstory. In the beginning of the film, you as the audience and the character Characters don't really know what the hell he is. Is he a demon? Is he some kind of a ghost? Is he a boogeyman that Nancy made up and somehow gained sentience? And even when you find out that he's the vengeful spirit of a dead serial killer, you still don't know what he was like when he was human or even how he's able to come back in the dream world. And you also get the idea that maybe even he doesn't fully understand his powers in the dream world because when Nancy is able to beat him at the end, he legitimately seems angry and surprised. And it's funny, you wouldn't think a villain who wears a red and green sweater would be as creepy as he is, but at least in this first movie, he's legitimately a creepy character. Now, Wes Craven apparently based the look for Freddy off of a homeless man that he saw one night wandering in the streets outside his house when he was a little kid and apparently it scared the shit out of him and stuck with him all the way till adulthood. He also named the character after a kid who bullied him in school. And you have the great John Saxon as Lieutenant Donald Thompson, Nancy's father, who you could tell does love Nancy, even though he can't always be there for her, and also he's one of the people who killed Freddy when he was human, and you can tell just how weirded out he is when Nancy starts talking about Freddy around him, and he's like, how does she know about him? I never told her about him, and I killed this guy. You also have Ronnie Blakely as Nancy's mother, Marge. Now, I've heard a lot of people kind of make fun of her acting or say that she wasn't that good in the film, and I have to disagree with that. I thought she did a great job in this movie playing this just stressed out and burnt out alcoholic mother. And a lot of the film's drama comes from Nancy and her mother's relationship, where you can tell that there's a lot of tension there, and it's tension that seems to have been building up over the years, even before Nancy started dreaming about Freddy. And it seems like Marge's alcoholism was a major factor in that tension. And you almost get the idea the reason she's an alcoholic is maybe because she's partly traumatized and might even feel some guilt over taking part in Freddy's murder, and yes, Freddy was a bad guy, I mean, he was a child murderer, and 
and possibly even a child molester, but at the same time, was it really her right to take his life? And a really interesting factor in Marge and Nancy's relationship is, throughout the film you see almost a role reversal, where you realize that Nancy is the more emotionally mature person, and when Marge gets drunk, she almost becomes kind of childlike, point at the end where Nancy is putting her mother to bed as if the roles are reversed, and Nancy's the mother and Marge is the daughter. Now, there's a scene in the movie where Marge takes Nancy to this clinic where they put her to sleep and they try to monitor her brain activity as she's dreaming, and the actor playing the doctor in that scene is Charles Fletcher, if I'm saying his last name right, who would go on to play the voice of Roger Rabbit in Who Framed Roger Rabbit? You also have Lynn Shay, who is Robert Shay's sister, playing Nancy's English teacher. Now, Lynn Shay would go on to make a name for herself in the Insidious movies, where she played arguably the best character in that franchise. But yeah, if you couldn't tell, I absolutely love this movie. And I'm not going to pretend it's necessarily a flawless film. I'll get into some of the problems that the movie has in a little bit, but this movie has a very special place in my heart. I first saw the movie when I was 10 years old. I remember this was around Christmas of 2002. This was right when 2002 was about to become 2003, and I remember I was over my grandparents' house, and my grandparents had a TV room in their basement, and me and my cousin watched this movie on On Demand. And I remember being so creeped out by it. It didn't necessarily traumatize me, but seeing it at that young age, it definitely got under my skin. Probably not a great idea for a 10-year-old to be watching A Nightmare on Elm Street, but hey, those were pretty formative years for me in terms of my love of horror. A few years later, I ended up getting the box set for Christmas, and I would just watch this movie all the time over the years. Like, this became a really important movie to me during my my teenage years. And I was lucky enough to see this movie in the theaters twice. Obviously not when it came out, because I wasn't alive in 1984, but they did a re-release of it back in, I want to say, 2016 or 2017, and I got to see this movie in the theaters. I also saw this movie in the theaters this past summer. There's a theater here on Long Island called the Cinema Arts Center, and they were doing an all-night slasher movie marathon, and they showed this along with the original Child's Play and Friday the 13th Part 6 and Slumber Party Massacre and the original Prom Night. It was actually a really fun night. Now, even though I might not find A Nightmare on Elm Street to be necessarily as scary as I did when I first saw it when I was 10, one of the reasons why this movie has resonated with me so much over the years... Now, I love slasher films, especially the 80s slasher films, but I'll be the first to admit that a lot of them are not exactly high-end entertainment, and a lot of them are not exactly the best examples of the horror genre. That being said, I actually do think the original A Nightmare on Elm Street is a little bit deeper and more cerebral than your typical 80s slasher film. And I do think Wes Craven is touching on a lot of really interesting themes in this movie. The film deals with themes like the loss of innocence, the inability of parents to protect their children, the sins of the parents being visited upon the children. The film also deals with themes of revenge and the morality of revenge, and whether or not revenge is always justified. Like, yes, Freddy Krueger was a bad guy and definitely deserved to be punished for what he did, but at the same time, was it really the parents' right to take justice into their own hands like that? Yes, the justice system failed by letting this guy go, but at the same time, they committed a crime too. Vigilantism is still a crime, even if they might be morally justified. And the parents did not pay for their crimes, so now it's Freddy's turn to take revenge. Revenge. And there is some legitimate characterization and actual drama in the film. Now, I don't know if this was intentional or not, but even though in the film Rod does admit to having dreams about Freddy, and it's implied that Glenn has had dreams about him as well, other than the scenes where they get killed, you don't actually see the dreams of the male characters in the movie. On screen, you only ever see Freddy invade the dreams of the female characters. 
This is something interesting that I've noticed about the film, and I don't know if it was intentional or not. And you can even read Freddy as sort of a symbol of toxic masculinity because it is implied that aside from being a murderer when he was human, he was also a sexual predator. And I would think invading a person's dreams would almost be the ultimate violation. So there are some possible feminist readings of A Nightmare on Elm Street, and in fact, a lot of feminist critics have looked to the character of Nancy as a great example of a strong female protagonist in a horror film. Also, this movie came out when the slasher genre was starting to wane a little bit, I think. Like, you had the slasher boom in the early 80s, but after that, you started to see it die down a little bit by this point. But this movie, being a supernatural slasher film, it kind of reinvented the slasher genre to some degree, because you didn't have that many outright supernatural slasher films prior to this. Sure, Halloween had elements of the supernatural, but that was still more implied than said outright. This was one of the first, like, outright supernatural slasher films, and it really did influence so much of the genre going forward. And this was such a unique and original film for the time. Sure, you had Dreamscape coming out the same year, but for the most part, you really didn't see a lot like Nightmare on Elm Street around this time. And in some ways, I would almost call this a mainstream surrealist film, because there are so many moments where you're not sure what is real and what is a dream. Like, there are moments where Nancy seems to be awake, but you're not sure. Is she awake, or is she in a dream at that point? And a lot of times, you actually don't know when Nancy is going into a dream or not. Yet at the same time, while you have a lot of surreal stuff happening in the movie, it also feels kind of grounded to some degree. Like in this movie, you have a scene where Nancy brings Freddy Krueger's hat out of her dream and into the real world. When you say that, it just sounds ludicrous, yet somehow when you watch the movie, you totally buy it. And by pulling the hat out of her dream, she realizes that she might be able to pull Freddy himself out of her dream into the real world, where he will become human again, or at least take on enough of a physical form for her to hurt him. And again, that might sound absurd, yet you totally buy it while watching the movie, because to some degree the film operates on dream logic, yet you don't realize that it's operating on dream logic. But even when she brings Freddy into the real world, there are moments where there are still some obvious supernatural things happening, so it leaves you to wonder, did she really bring him out of the dream? Is she really awake at that point? Or is she still in the dream? And even the film's final scene is very interpretive, where you don't know if that's real or a dream. Did Nancy wake up and the whole movie was a dream? Is the nightmare starting all over again? Like, again, there's so many different interpretations you could make. And then, of course, you have the scenes with the little girls singing the jump rope song, One, Two, Freddy's Coming For You. And those scenes are so creepy and off-putting, and I always used to wonder if those girls are supposed to be, like, the spirit of the children that Kruger murdered when he was human, or are they like angels sent from heaven to warn of Freddy's presence? Now, like I said, while this is one of my absolute favorite films, I'm not going to pretend this is necessarily a perfect film. While it does take itself very seriously, the movie does have moments of camp. While the movie does have a lot of really impressive special effects, not all of the effects work necessarily holds up the best in the movie. Now granted, the movie is almost 40 years old at this point, and we also have to remember that the movie did have a very low budget. And the movie does get a little cheesy towards the end when Nancy brings Freddy into the real world and he supposedly becomes human again and she has all those booby traps set up in the house. It's like, okay, this is kind of silly. But I also think the movie is so well made that at that point you almost don't care how silly the movie is starting to get. And you know what? It is very cathartic to see Freddy get a sledgehammer to his stomach. Now, there was a deleted scene where it was revealed that Nancy had an older sibling that Marge and Donald never told her about that Freddy killed, and that was part of the reason Marge and Donald joined this mob that killed Freddy. And I kind of wish that was left in the movie, because that gives Nancy and Freddy's final battle a whole new context. Now, of course, I have to talk about the music in this movie. Charles Bernstein's score for 
for the film. I think it's one of the best horror movie scores and one of the most iconic horror movie scores. I would hold it right up there with John Carpenter's score for Halloween. Like, the music in this film is so eerie, and I remember when I first saw this movie, the music almost creeped me out as much as Freddy himself. Now, Wes Craven had no intention of there being sequels to this. He wanted this to be a standalone film, and I still think A Nightmare on Elm Street can work as a standalone horror film, but the movie was a massive hit and ended up spawning a huge multimedia franchise, which included seven sequels, which ran from 1985 to 2003, the final Nightmare on Elm Street sequel being Freddy vs. Jason, which was also a cross over with the Friday the 13th franchise, set in those two franchises in the same universe, even though I'm sure that was not Wes Craven's intention when he made the first movie. And then there was a remake to this movie made in 2010. Now, there was an attempt, at least in the first two sequels, to maintain the dark and creepy tone of the original, but as time went on and the films became more commercial, they also became more comedic and a lot more campy. And Freddy went from being a genuinely pretty scary character to almost more of a dark comedian by the time we got to the fourth film, and he would make a joke whenever he would kill people people, and the sixth Nightmare on Elm Street movie was an outright comedy. But the sequels, almost more so than the first movie, made Freddy Krueger a pop culture icon. There was also a short-lived TV series in the late 80s called Freddy's Nightmares, which was more or less an anthology series where each episode was a different story, and Freddy simply narrated the stories, almost like the Crypt Keeper. Although I think the pilot episode was about Freddy's trial when he was human. However, most fans don't really count the show as actually being canon. There have also been multiple Nightmare on Elm Street comic books and tie-in novels. However, whether you count any of these as actually being canon is highly debatable. And I think each film in the franchise, including the first one, has had a novelization made to it. Freddy Krueger even showed up at the end of the ninth Friday the 13th movie, Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday, which is the one that kind of led into Freddy vs. Jason. Freddy's glove even made an appearance appearance in Bride of Chucky, implying that the Child's Play series is in the same universe as the Nightmare on Elm Street series. However, that is highly debatable, and I took that as more of an in-joke rather than suggesting that the two franchises are canon to each other. There have also been video games, and Freddy Krueger himself became a playable character in Mortal Kombat. And of course, there's been toys and merchandising. It's actually kind of darkly ironic that they've done toys marketed towards children based on Freddy Krueger, yet the character of Freddy is supposed to be a child murderer and possibly even a child molester. Freddy and the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise has been parodied so many times throughout pop culture. Freddy has even appeared on episodes of South Park and even appeared as late as a 2018 episode of the sitcom The Goldbergs, and it actually was Robert Englin playing him. Another weird Nightmare on Elm Street reference in pop culture, on the show Recess, you had the character of King Bob, who apparently was designed to actually look like a kid version of Glenn from A Nightmare on Elm Street. A Nightmare on Elm Street has also had multiple rip-offs and cash-ins, like Dream Maniac, Bad Dreams, Beyond Dreams Door... This even influenced later installments of already pre-existing horror franchises. For example, Prom Night 2 and especially Slumber Party Massacre 2, you could tell, were heavily inspired by this movie. And this movie really did sort of popularize the supernatural slasher film. Like, after this, you had characters like Michael Myers and Jason Voorhees become more outright supernatural in their movies. And after this movie, there was a whole subgenre of movies about serial killers who mess around with black magic and become a supernatural being. Movies like Child's Play, obviously. 
or the horror show, or Sleep Stalker, or even Jack Frost. Even Wes Craven kind of ripped off this movie a little bit with his film Shocker. I think he even admitted that Shocker was sort of his attempt to make a another Freddy Krueger-like character. You could tell the character of Vecna, the main antagonist of Stranger Things Season 4, was heavily inspired by Freddy Krueger. In fact, that whole season almost felt like the best Nightmare on Elm Street sequel we never got. And the fact that Robert Englund had a cameo on that season was no coincidence. Even Terrifier 2, you could tell, was heavily influenced by Nightmare on Elm Street. Nightmare on Elm Street is just two years shy of being 40 years old, and it's still influencing so much in the horror genre today. Now, I also want to point out that there are a lot of similarities between Nightmare on Elm Street and Stephen King's It. Now, even though It was published after the first Nightmare on Elm Street movie... Stephen King started working on that book in the early 80s, so I'm not accusing either Stephen King or Wes Craven of ripping each other off. It's just sort of a similar idea that kind of came about around the same time. Now, some of you might already know that earlier this year, my friend Chris passed away. Now, Chris contributed to my 2018 retrospective on the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, and... I was initially not going to do this because he's no longer with us, but at the same time, he had such insightful things to say about this movie, and this is sort of my way of remembering him, so uh, here is audio from that video of him giving his thoughts on the original A Nightmare on Elm Street. So, there's no denying this one's a classic, obviously. Um, what was so cool about it was... It was such a unique idea, the idea that, all right, this dude got taken out by all the parents in Springwood, and now he's just coming after their kids in their dreams, which is such a scary concept, especially when you really think about the idea of, like, somebody coming after you in your dreams, not... And it's it's not a dream to some degree. It is He is physically, like, corporeally coming after you, and you will die if uh, you die in the dream. And the, the fear of that is, is really what fuels the first one. Obviously, you grow used to it with the sequels, but uh, with the first one, it's a real, like, smack in the face. Like, holy shit, that would be the freakiest thing ever. And the character of Freddy is just so unique and so distinct because, like, you got this horribly scarred guy who's got knives for fingers um, and the fedora and, the you know, the, the Christmas sweater, as a lot of people call it. Um, it all just, like, comes together so well, and it, it makes this character so unique and so interesting and um i i always enjoyed that scene where he's where he's chasing tina in the opening it's it's so <laughs> it's so freaky even today like where he starts cutting his fingers off and everything um i love the original so much uh nancy uh, i think christian agrees with me it's one of the best final girls ever um Heather Langenkamp, yeah, she really kind of delivers i i rewatched it recently and admittedly some of the acting kind of had me going eh. But uh, Heather really, yeah, she's she's really keeps you invested in the movie. It's it's a great part. Johnny's obviously got such a like a unique death that people are still like joking around about. And even like her mother, um, I, I like the relationship between Nancy and her mother in this because her mother is just like jaded and um, totally stoic about what's going on. And Nancy's just like, you need to like cut this shit and talk to me about this because like obviously there's a problem. Kids are getting murdered. Um, and it even speaks more to Nancy's resourcefulness that she just kind of like steps up, knows that there's something that has to be done, and then actually, in effect, comes after him um, rather than him coming after her. Um, it, it's just a great horror movie. It's just a, such a brilliant concept that was so well executed and had such great characterization. And that's why it, it stays a classic even today. I hope you enjoyed that, and here is audio from that same video of college professor William Burns giving his thoughts on the original Nightmare on Elm Street. Now, he had a lot more to say about the movie, but if you want to know more of his thoughts, just watch that whole video. Again, the link to that video is in the description below. Now, Bill, when was the first time you saw the original in Nightmare on Elm Street, and what did you think of it? I think I saw it about a year after it came out. I didn't, I didn't see it in the movie theater, but I think I saw it about a year after it came out. Either 
either on VHS or on you know, on cable, one of the cable channels. And but I had heard about it. Obviously, there was a big marketing campaign for it on TV. Freddy was already sort of becoming a sort of a horror icon, even though it was only his first movie. And I was fascinated by. It. I remember seeing the commercials and and being just really wanting to see the movie. And it certainly did not disappoint me. I remember watching it and being like, "This is horrifying." It was a horrifying film, you know. And I think one of the things that it gets to in the film, uh, that the film gets to in some ways, is the vulnerability, right? Is that sort of we're all, the one time we're most vulnerable is when we sleep. And there's no way you can, you have to sleep. You have to dream. It's it's part of, you know, uh, it's it's part of um, health, like, you know, it's not part of biology. So that's a, a horrifying fear to think that you can't even escape, even in sleep, you can't escape from, you know, this danger. And I just remember, I thought it was just a, a, a great movie. Um, I enjoyed it uh, so much. And um, I thought it was one of those things where uh, you know, I, just, I was excited because a new sort of a new horror franchise was born. Here is audio of my friend John and my friend Mark Allen Gunnels giving their thoughts on the original A Nightmare on Elm Street. And again, this audio is taken from the 2018 video. First one is a really, really good film because the concept behind about a killer killing your sleep is really, really scary and uh, Robert England, he makes this. He he is Freddy Krueger. It's hard to like imagine anyone else playing Freddy but him. And uh, Heather Langenkamp, she's a strong female character who's like who you really feel sorry for, like because she loses a lot of her friends, she loses her boyfriend. And I have to admit, Johnny Johnny Depp, wow, like <laughs> it's just amazing how like where he started his career before he was like a big shot. And it's people who are looking back at this film, they think to themselves, wow, I worked with Johnny Depp, I just didn't know it at the time. Um, the Nine on Elm Street series is probably my favorite horror series. Uh, I grew up in the 80s when we had what I called the big three franchises. Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th, and Halloween. My favorite single movie from those series is the original Halloween by John Carpenter. But when it comes to overall series, Nightmare on Elm Street is my favorite. I think because... The dream aspect made it so imaginative and creative, and it could go in so many different directions, more than just a killer with a knife. Uh, the first uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, written and directed by the great, late Wes Craven, um, I think is a wonderful film. Um, the concept alone, the man who hunts you in your dreams, and if you get killed in your dreams, then you die in real life, that's ingenious. It's simple, yet ingenious. And it had so many possibilities and so many directions it could go. It had a great atmosphere, that first film. Um, a very oppressive, a very suspenseful atmosphere. Some great characters. Uh, Heather Langenkamp as the heroine Nancy, I thought, had the right um, combination of strength and vulnerability. She really made you root for her. Um, there was some family drama going on that I thought added to the story. And I just thought it was a really well done movie. And finally, before I end this video, I want to cut to my friends Christian Feliciano and Jeremy Schwartz giving their thoughts on the original A Nightmare on Elm Street. And both of these audio clips were recorded specifically for this video. A Nightmare on Elm Street is so unique to the slasher genre. Because when you think about those films, it's always pretty much the same thing. You have a guy in a mask. Um, chasing people through the forest or through a neighborhood or something like that. But here we have a slasher who is, I mean, he can enter your dreams. He's the dream master. He can go into your dreams. And the fact that you can't even physically escape him because he can get you in your dreams when you're asleep, when you're most vulnerable, is terrifying. It's very unique. It's a very unique idea um, that this guy can just get you <laughs> whenever he wants. And the fact that you don't even know you're sleeping is just... Um, I mean, that's just terrifying. That's a, a, a great idea. I think Wes Craven did an amazing job with this film. This is, to me, his best film of all time. I know there's Last House on the Left, and he's done many other films, but this is his masterpiece, in my opinion. I think Nightmare on Elm Street is just perfect. The sequels, you know, I'm not really into them. I haven't watched them in forever. Um, don't even know if I've seen all of them. But I do really enjoy the first one. I think the first one is fantastic. Um, the main character is very um, sympathetic. She's very sympathetic. She, you understand her. Johnny Depp is in this film, which is, is I think this is his first role. And um, the way, what happens to him, I won't say everything, I won't spoil anything, but what happens in this film with him 
is just such an iconic scene. I think there's so many iconic things in this film, things that other people have stolen from um, because of how you know influential this uh, film is. You know, you watch it, you get inspired to want to make your own film or your, write your own story or something. And that's why most people take from it because it just, it's one of those films that's just so iconic, I think is, is the way to describe it. Um, the writing is fantastic. The story behind Freddy Krueger, why he does what he does is amazing. It's unique. It's not the same old, um, the same old, same old. Like it's a unique idea. Um, the fact that he is, is, uh, it, there's there's a ambiguity in the morality of this story um, because at some you know at some point I do describe that the people were trying to get justice um, against Freddy and that just caused the curse to happen which is kind of the same thing with us House on the Left it's almost the same message of violence begets violence. Um, that's pretty much the message here. I really like that. I, I think that that's unique. Wes Craven is, is a masterpiece. Um, rest in peace. I love him to death. I love this film. I highly recommend you check it out. If you haven't checked it out before, this is one of the gems of the slasher genre. This is not just a, you know, uh, a grindhouse, you know, messy film that just, you know, for mindless fun, this is actually smart. This has a brain behind it. And I highly recommend it. Uh, thank you so much for everything. Bye-bye. The original Nightmare on Elm Street movie is not only one of my favorite horror movies of all time, but also one of my favorite movies in general. It's incredibly scary, has genuine chills, has a great cast, has some amazing death scenes, and it's just all around a great movie. Robert Englund gives an incredibly creepy performance as Freddy Krueger, and I like how the character is very dark and in the shadows unlike in the later sequels in which he became a comical jokester. This version of Freddy does have some humor to him, but it's very dark and sadistic humor, not silly like in the later films. I was fortunate enough to meet Robert Englund twice, and he was very nice both times. I remember the second time I met him, my dad actually got him on video giving me the choke hold for a photo. I got it. Oh, okay. Thank you. Let me know. My face will freeze like that. <laughs> it's also great to see Johnny Depp in his very first film. He does a decent job, especially since he didn't originally set out to be an actor. And I also really enjoyed John Saxon as Lieutenant Donald Thompson. He was really good at playing tough cops. I had the pleasure of meeting John Saxon at Monster Mania way back in 2010. I got him to sign a photo and also got a photo with him. May he rest in peace. I've also had the pleasure of meeting Heather Langenkamp, Amanda Wiss, and Ronnie Blakely. I specifically remember Ronnie saying that Johnny Depp was really sweet. They all do a great job in the movie as well. Heather gives Nancy the perfect amount of feistiness needed for the... Uh, final girl in this film. I also met Joseph Whip, who played Sergeant Parker. He was really nice too, and he's also very good in the movie. I also want to mention J. Sue Garcia, aka Nick Corey, as Rod Lane. He does a perfect job acting like a tough guy, but then showing a sensitive side to the character. This is most obvious in the scene in which he's talking to Nancy from the jail cell. Like I said before, this movie has a lot of genuine chills. Robert Englund's performance, the scenery, and the musical score all contribute to this. Now, if I have one nitpick about this movie, it's that a lot of things are left unsaid, which I think could have been expanded upon even more. For example, when Nancy is talking to Rod in jail, Rod reveals that he had a dream about a man with knives for fingers. I always thought that Nancy should have revealed that she had the dream about him as well, but instead she just looks shocked and walks out the door. The same thing happens when Nancy is talking to Glenn on the phone. They, there's so much more that could be said that uh, I think is just a bit of a wasted opportunity. But still, though, that's just a nitpick in what I believe is an amazing and terrifying film. 
It's amazing what this movie was able to accomplish, considering New Line Cinema didn't have a lot of money to work with and was even on the verge of bankruptcy. All in all, I love this movie, and I just can't say enough good things about it. If you haven't seen it, I suggest you check it out immediately. I hope you enjoyed that, and I hope you enjoyed this video overall. Again, that was my review on A Nightmare on Elm Street, and my next movie review will be on the first of the Nightmare on Elm Street sequels, A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2, Freddy's Revenge.